Tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. We all have that one game we love. Something that we can go back to and instantly be taken back to a time where things felt different. Felt almost better. As time moves forward though, and games move from a physical to a digital medium, we run the risk of having many of these amazing games, these works of art, taken away from us for no real reason other than publisher greed. Sometimes a publisher would just rather shut down a server, and let that be that. Other times, it's down to malicious intent for the game's player base, and recently, disturbingly, the developer. And now, unlike any other point in recent history, a game could be removed and just straight up erased due to political differences. As though the art of the game doesn't even matter in the eyes of some of these people. That it's just not worth preserving. With this video, I'd like to document some of these abandoned gems, really shine a light on the censorship, and talk about some of the projects that I really genuinely miss. Before I do that, let me tell you about today's sponsor, a company that actually helped me get this video out when I really needed a few extra bucks so I can hire on a few extra people, but also a company that stands for privacy and equal access to information, no matter where you happen to be from. CyberGhost VPN is a virtual private network provider trusted by more than 30 million people from around the world. By using their software, you can encrypt your information, change your IP address, access blocked streaming services or websites, and most importantly, stay safe online and away from the prying eyes of people like your ISP or even someone worse. CyberGhost VPN lets you play games blocked in your region and even lowering your ping at times, which is very important and very relevant to this video. They also have 5,600 VPN servers located in more than 90 countries. So so there's plenty of options out there for you. If you'd like to test out CyberGhost VPN, I have a special price just for you. A 77% discount, basically $275 a month. Just click on the link in the description and you'll benefit from this great discount. You should also know that CyberGhost VPN has dedicated apps for all operating systems from Windows, a Mac, and Android, and even Linux or smart TVs. And with just one subscription, you can protect up to seven of these devices at the same time. With a 45 day money back guarantee, there's nothing really to lose. Give it a shot and you might be pleasantly surprised about what a VPN can do for you. I know that I certainly was. With that said, please sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to be scared. These are 14 abandoned video games you unfortunately can't play anymore. So we recently discussed this game in the most deeply disturbing horror indie games. It was a mega hit, topping Steam charts, getting various awards and videos made about it by high profile content creators like Super Eyepatch Wolf and Jacksepticeye, and overall selling quite well. This was until a placeholder game asset that made fun of the Chinese president Xi Jinping was found. We should mention that this placeholder asset wasn't meant to remain in the game. It was a placeholder, meant to be removed at a later date and replaced with something that would be more fitting for the game's themes. That said, the placeholder asset roughly translates to Xi Jinping Winnie the Pooh. After this was discovered, the game was mysteriously pulled from all retailers and online distribution sites. That's where we last left the game, with the simple hope that maybe it would come back and that people like me could experience the game firsthand because it is a genuine work of art and commentary on Taiwanese culture. That said, since then, a lot more has happened. First, in the wake of the controversy, publishers Indevin and Winking Entertainment cut ties with Red Candle Studios, the game's original developer. Red Candle's account on Weibo, the Chinese social media network, is currently still blocked. 
Shortly after all of this, Red Candle lost their business license and is currently working on a way to make this game playable again in some form. Apparently, this asset that was never supposed to be in the game in the first place broke some reverence laws in China, which is putting everyone involved in a genuinely terrible position. It should be noted that Red Candle games are well known for criticizing aspects of the Chinese government and the actions they took in the past towards Taiwan, as well as making commentary on contemporary Taiwanese life. As a result, it looks like we'll never get to see devotion come back. The abandonment and destruction of this art is all because of a man who is so insecure about being compared to Winnie the Pooh, a Disney character, got upset over a placeholder asset personally that was removed less than a few hours after its discovery. And as a result, devotion and all future Red Campbell games for the time being may be abandoned. If you're a fan of video games, comics, and the surrounding nerd culture from the mid to late 2000s, then you might remember a little gem that exploded on the indie scene known as Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. First, it was a comic created by Brian Lee O'Malley which saw publication from 2004 to 2010, and it received multiple awards, including seeing its main character, Scott Pilgrim, ranking 85th on Wizard Magazine's 2008 list of the greatest comic book characters of all time. And then came the movie based on the story which, at the time, was scheduled for a release in July or August of 2010. And of course a film like that is gonna get serious hype from fans of the series. So it's no surprise that Ubisoft eagerly announced at Comic Con 2009 that it was developing a game based on the franchise to be released on the Xbox Live Arcade and the PlayStation Network at around the same time. As for the game itself, well, it ended up being based more on the comic book than the movie that it was intended to promote, particularly when it came to the graphics. It was a beat-em-up for up to four players, who could take the roles of multiple unique characters from the series, fighting through different levels with the end goal of defeating the love interest Ramona's seven evil exes. Gathering cash allowed you to upgrade your character, and there was even a mode where the player could endlessly fight zombies with their character of choice. And let's be frank here. What comic book slash video game fan wouldn't want to kill a bunch of 16-bit zombies while wielding a giant hammer? With a soundtrack from chiptune punk band Anna Managuchi, designed by Paul Robertson, and of course an award-winning original story to work from, it was released on the PlayStation Network first on August 10th, 2010, and then on the Xbox Live Arcade 15 days later. Overall review scores range from middling to favorable with consistently great praise for the aforementioned comic-inspired pixel art and unique music in particular. There was a mixed response for the multiplayer however with the sweet spot seeming to be in the 2-3 player range but overall, most seemed to agree that it would make people fall in love with beat em ups and multiplayer chaos all over again. Unfortunately that good news wouldn't last. By December 30th, 2014, just over three and a half years after its initial release, the game was removed from both PSN and the Xbox Arcade without any warning or obvious explanation. The most likely cause, as is often the case for works like this with so many different people involved, was licensing issues. Between Ubisoft holding the rights to the game, Anna Managuchi holding the rights to the music, and O'Malley himself owning the rights to the IP, we can speculate that the sheer amount of contracts that would have been needed to be renewed was likely seen as too much for Ubisoft to want to bother with for a relatively niche game. One silver lining to all this is that it looks like Mr. O'Malley is on the fans side. On August 10th, 2016, he tweeted out, My number one goal in life is to get the Scott Pilgrim video game released. Here's hoping he can make something happen, because considering how many years it's been, however, world will just have to wait and see. Legend of Zelda Four Swords was a multiplayer mode added to the GBA remake of the SNES classic A Link to the Past. 
It allowed for up to four players to team up in a co-op Zelda-style game as one of four differently colored links. But even back then, getting four different GBAs with four copies of the game and three link cables on top of that was a costly undertaking. So you'd be forgiven if you missed out on this particular entry of this beloved franchise. However, in 2011, as part of their celebration of Zelda's 25th anniversary, Nintendo released a remastered version of Four Swords as a free download for the DSi and 3DS. While this version removed the ability to play A Link to the Past, it made up for it by allowing you to play the entire Four Swords part by yourself by making it so you could switch control between one of two Links on the fly. New stages were also added to the game in which players could unlock the Master Sword and the Hurricane Spin, which were only available through playing A Link to the Past in the original GBA release. Since this was released as part of the 25th anniversary of the Zelda series, this game was made unavailable for download in February the following year. Nintendo did re-release the game on Nintendo eShop to celebrate the positive reception of A Link Between Worlds after its release, but it was once again removed within a few days and hasn't been re-released since. So as of right now, there may not be a way to actually get this version of Four Swords, but if you did download it in the brief windows you had, you can technically still play it, just don't expect to play it with a friend who just got a brand new 3S anytime soon. Just to reiterate, there is absolutely no reason why this game needs to be abandoned. It was removed for no real reason other than to create scarcity. And considering how hard Nintendo tends to push its litigation against people who even think about Mario the wrong way, this just rubs salt in the wound. Anybody who's played games in the last 10 years, I'm pretty sure knows of Valve and their mega hit Team Fortress 2, a game which not only have I been investing in thanks to this list, but a game which by popular belief popularized a style of cartoony graphics that inspired many games to follow in its wake. Games like Overwatch, uh, Brink, another less loved game that I still really like, and the subject of today's discussion, Loadout, a pretty obscure release by a company known as Edge of Reality, who is mainly known for making Nintendo 64 ports of successful games on other platforms, and even the world-renowned Shark Tale game. I didn't realize they had a game, and I didn't realize it needed a port, but here we are. Loadout was released on January 31st, 2014, and this is around the time me and my buddies found this game. Uh, me and my creepypasta narrator buddies were often playing this game on our free time. It was free to play a third person shooter and featured fast paced action, weapon customization, and player customization, as well as a few basic team based game modes such as capture the flag, control the points, and yada yada yada. Y you get the whole Schwitz bang. What gave this game a more unique feel from its contemporaries is the inclusion of more unique game modes such as Extraction, a game mode where one player from each team is assigned to pick up Blutonium, which is a kind of mineral found around a map, and then they have to carry it all the way back to a specific point and drop it off for the actual collection of points. The other players had to kind of protect them, and it, it was a really fun game. There was also Annihilation, but unfortunately I don't have much first-hand experience with it, but basically it was a mode that combined every classic game mode together. Upon its release, the game received pretty positive scores on Steam. It had a very positive overall review, and many positive reviews from actual bona fide game journalists. Despite the game getting very positive feedback from just about everybody it kind of fell into obscurity. They seemed to stop updating the game around 2015, 2016, and it never really managed to develop a true identity for itself aside from the art style, nor did Loadout really invent any new revolutionary gameplay mechanics aside from the create your own gun that can do just about anything sort of, you know, gameplay. After reaching its initial hype, its initial peak if you will, the player base shot right down to 50 to 200 players concurrently on PC. It was just a game for mindless fun, something you could play after a long day of work when you're bored. It didn't really invite you to take anything seriously, so when you played your games, there was no rage to be had. Just as things were starting to get better with the release of the PlayStation 4 version and its player base growing, 
The game saw its doom with the new European regulations for user data protection. Due to the unstable revenue of the game and the ever-changing climate of the gaming industry where competition was brutal and the increasing costs of server maintenance, Loadout could not even comply with these demands. So it had to shut down on May 24th, 2018, roughly four years after its release. Near the end of this game's life cycle, I actually tried to get back into it. I invested some money into microtransactions that I simply weren't able to do in 2014, and I wanted to try to give this game another shot because I remember it being so much fun. However, the servers were dead by 2017, and because of that, I invested money into something I effectively couldn't even play. There were roughly 25 people total playing the game at the time. So, yeah, this was a fantastic game, a absolutely fun, not necessarily masterpiece of a game, but one that was fun to sit down and play. Now, we can only remember this game as a failed project by devs who tried to make it into a highly competitive, constantly evolving gaming industry. Now, I, this is the part where I'd say, oh man, I, I hope Edge of Reality makes another great game, but as of 2017, Edge of Reality? no longer in business. So now we have both a dead game and a dead dev. I don't know about you, but the finality of that statement kind of disturbs me that the games that I spend money on and invest into can be just taken away from me due to factors outside of anyone's control. When you think large-scale first-person shooters, you'd be forgiven if EA's less-than-stellar Battlefield series comes to mind. However, at one time, there was a game that put players in much larger battles and, oddly enough, it was console exclusive. MAG, short for the incredibly clever name Massive Action Game, was an online-only multiplayer FPS developed by Zipper Interactive and released exclusively for the PlayStation 3 in early 2010. This game put players into one of three mercenary groups fighting for contracts around the world in what's called the also terribly clever Shadow War. Of course, the biggest selling point of the game, however, was the aforementioned high player count. Depending on the game mode, anywhere from 64 to 256 players could coexist on a single map. Players would be divided into four eight-person squads, which could then be placed into either two or four platoons. Each squad, platoon, and in the largest mode, the entire 128 person army would have a player be assigned various positions of leadership, which would give that player special abilities, similar to the kill streaks of Call of Duty. Unfortunately, MAG's servers were shut down in January of 2014, capping its lifespan at just four years. And when you put an online only game on a platform that doesn't allow for the use of private servers, well, that renders the game completely unplayable and lands it on our list today. There really hasn't been anything quite like it since. As for Zipper Interactive, they've been defunct since 2012. And while there don't seem to be any plans for this IP in the works, a game called Planet Side 2 is available and seems to expand on Mag's original concept by having all the battles happen in real time on a single continent-sized map that players can fast travel around freely. The only problems here are that Planet Side has its own pay-to-win elements and a shrinking player base that gives it its own countdown to a creepy reading mention. Originally debuting in 1991 and created by the combined efforts of the infamous 90s comic book artist Rob Liefeld, who produced the design and name, and the lesser-known Fabian Nicicia, who focused on the characterization and witty dialogue, Deadpool, aka Wade Winston Wilson, has been a famous character in comic books not just due to his overload of weapons and tendency to unalive people, but also his constant snarky humor, fourth-wall-cracking jokes, and of course his love of obscure 70s and 80s actresses cum comedians. This is a different kind of superhero story. It's honestly a surprise they didn't make a game about him sooner. After first being announced at San Diego Comic-Con 2012, Marvel revealed that it was able to get together a $100 million budget for Activision's at the time newly acquired High Moon Studios to develop Deadpool the game, which makes it one of the most expensive games that came out for that generation. Who has two guns and has a video game coming out next year? This guy! The game was released on June 25th, 2013 for Windows, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. 
A strange mix of action-adventure, beat-em-up, third-person shooter, and platformer, the at-times abrupt changes in gameplay seem to fit the character well. The story is also somewhat jarring, but still in character for Deadpool, featuring the anti-hero running around trying to help High Moon Studios make his game better, with added explosions, a short-range teleportation device he's more than happy to point out he isn't supposed to have, and of course a crazy, abrupt ending that fans of the guy should have probably expected. The game ended up with very mixed reviews, to say the least. Both fans and critics seem to agree that while the humor and storyline were spot-on for a Deadpool product, the gameplay was only rewarding in short bursts before the combat began to get stale and repetitive. It got better as more moves and weapons unlocked, of course, but it still dragged down the game's overall ratings. This may be part of the reason why on January 1st, 2014, just six months after the initial release, the game was pulled from shelves, despite it officially being because of Activision's then-expired contract with Marvel. It took a year and a half before the company decided to remaster and re-release the game to cross-promote the first Deadpool movie, and it came out again in November 2015 for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Of course, by 2017, it was once more removed from both live services, this time seemingly for good. The reason for this was, once again, licensing issues. Considering how persistent Deadpool's ever-expanding fanbase is, though, maybe Square Enix, who now have the rights to his and other Marvel characters' video games, will give this franchise another shot. I fell in love with this game ever since its first beta back in 2011, 2012. At the time, I had a terrible Sony Vio laptop that could only get the game up to 15 or 20 frames per second, no disposable income, and I was only able to play this game through the kindness of an online friend who I think is named Wade that wanted to play this game with me. He was kind, he was nice, and honestly, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't even be here discussing this game today. So if you're somehow watching this, Wade, thanks for the kindness, and hit me up if you want me to repay the favor. The best way to describe this game is like a more advanced version of a multiplayer-only Mountain Blade, or more aptly, Mordhau. Directional combat means that you could pull your mouse up, down, left, or right, which would initiate some sort of thrust swipe or overhead swing. If you damage a player enough, you could get them into a dying state, which would allow you to initiate a brutal looking execution, which even looks nice by today's standards. You would cut them and they would be able to see that in a first person perspective, which was absolutely horrifying. What made this game special, however, was the hitboxes. The armor you wore dictated what kind of weapons would be effective against you. In fact, the amount of damage was not only dictated by the strike of the weapon and its type, but also the speed of the blade and where it hit. If you were only to, say, nick someone in the face at the tip of the blade, then expect minimal damage. If you had a helmet on, expect that damage to be reduced to zero. If the weapon was blunt, however, and he did an overhead strike, he probably would die from that. Or let's say you hit him directly into shield with a blunt weapon. You might break that shield. Yes, that's right. If you hit a weapon or shield or blade far too many times, it could snap or break, leaving you with nothing but a sidearm to go off of. At higher levels, you get more options in which to stab, bash, or cut your enemies, and access to even more stupid cosmetics, which the developers took great lengths into making historically accurate to the historical time of the War of the Roses, which was not only hilarious, but kind of, you know, awesome to see in a game. When it first came out, War of the Roses that is, it had quite a bit of hype behind it and a player number to match that. However, it wasn't the success the developers wanted. They even introduced microtransactions and micro DLC in order to try to squeeze more money out of the players. All of this information I'm giving you it hasn't been documented, not even on the wiki or in any other video on YouTube. I swear, even progression felt slowed as time went on. However, before any of this could be noticed by game journalists and pundits like Jim Sterling, who would absolutely be vocal about the terrible changes made, the player base was already decimated. It went from thousands to mere hundreds to microtransactions not even documented by anyone, so finding footage of any of this is incredibly difficult. 
and I only really have memory to go off of. This change was implemented after the game stopped getting regular updates in 2014, so I don't have any real way to figure out when they were introduced in the first place. War of the Roses would be decimated even further by the release of War of the Vikings, a glorified graphical conversion mod which split the player base, and while well, they did inject new life into the series for, I don't know, a couple of months, it did so by removing the ability to thrust and rushing out a product that felt like nothing more than a couple of people working for a couple of months on what felt like a mod. The amount of abilities were cut down in half, your moveset was reduced significantly, and in the end the maps were incredibly small, so a lot of people ended up leaving this game because it just wasn't as fun nor as innovative as War to Roses was, which left to both games being shuttered. Now here's the messed up thing about all of this. You could actually pay to host your own community server back when both games were active and alive. However, when the developers decided to shut down this game, they refused to release the tools that allowed for community hosted servers. You can no longer play this game even if you bought it, and on top of that, you can't even buy this game from any sort of official retailer anymore. So right now, it's, it's nothing but a footnote in history, one that lacks any real documentation outside of my own memories. It's almost like a fever dream, going back and remembering and writing all of this down to share with you guys because quite frankly, no one else has. It was a fantastic game and it's absolutely unacceptable and insane that just because someone who made this game refuses to release tools that were already made, no one can play this game that they spent hard earned money on. And I'm never gonna have an opportunity to play this game again. It's one that I have many fond memories of. I've spent many hours in and it's gone for no real reason other than the developer abandoned it and has decided that we're not allowed to enjoy it anymore either. The Simpsons Arcade Game Now here's one that I remember fondly. The Simpsons Arcade Game was the second ever game in the widely beloved franchise featuring the classic American family turned on its ear. The first being Bart vs. the Space Mutants, published just a month earlier for home consoles. The game was developed and published by Konami in 1991, and first available in arcades, soon finding itself ported to multiple platforms and finally seeing its last official release on the Xbox Live Arcade and PSN in 2012. In a nutshell, The Simpsons stumble upon Montague Burns' loyal assistant, Waylon Smithers, robbing a jewelry store of all things. Homer and Smithers collide, causing the latter to drop a precious gem which ends up replacing Maggie's pacifier. From there, the race is on through the streets of Springfield, where our dysfunctional yellow protagonists fight their way past new and familiar enemies on their quest to recover the youngest Simpsons girl, and the jewels. The game was named the number one cartoon-based game of all time by Screw Attack and received scores ranging from 4.5 to 5 out of 5 in many gaming publications. While some people say that the game received a lot of its praise due to having the Simpsons name, in reality it had some really fun game mechanics like characters having different attacks or you and your co-op allies initiating chain attacks with different results depending on what characters were involved. The game really had something going for it until its unfortunate removal from online platforms starting in December of 2013. Unlike some of the other games on this list, there's still at least one last chance to play this game, albeit in a slightly modified version. But when support for Flash vanishes in 2020, you'll be out of legal ways to play it. Anyone who had a smartphone in late 2013, early 2014 either had this game installed at some point, or has at least heard of it. Flappy Bird was developed by Dong Win as Dot Gears, who has stated that it had been, quote, designed to play in a few minutes when you are relaxed. The player's avatar is a cute little yellow bird known as Fabby, and he or she helps it fly between green pipes, earning one point for each successful pass. 
The game has no time limit. The player can continue for hours just staring at the screen, tapping to keep Fabi in the air, or not tapping to let gravity do its thing, racking up points to earn a high score. This was part of the problem. The gameplay was ridiculously addictive and difficult. At the time of scripting, RecordSetter.com has the highest Flappy Bird score as 1,940 points by one Ben King in October 2014. That's over 40 minutes of continuously tapping at a screen to watch a dopey bird fly past continuous Mario-esque green pipes. For a change of pace, it was Wynn himself who removed the game from stores on February 1st, 2014. He gave exactly 22 hours notice to fans over Twitter, and right on time, it disappeared from both the Apple App Store and Google Play. Newspapers speculated that it had been because of threats from Nintendo for using their assets, but Nintendo spokesperson Yoshihiro Minigawa went out of his way to assure the Wall Street Journal via email that they never complained at all about Flappy Bird's graphics looking similar to Super Mario Bros. When interviewed by Forbes, Wynn was eager to clear the air, saying that he took it down without being prompted. He further said he took it down because he was feeling so much guilt over the game being accidentally addictive that he was losing sleep, and he felt like a weight had been lifted after removing it. Eventually, he released a toned-down version called Flappy Bird's Family that he hoped was less addictive and had multiplayer capability. It's exclusively available through Amazon's apps. However, the original is currently only around via fan-made recreations and endless clones. Overkill and Starbreeze Studios. Those are, well, two names that mean quite a bit to me. They helped publish not only one of my favorite games of all time, Dead by Daylight, but also Payday 2, which are both games that still hold a fairly sizable player base to this day. Overkill's The Walking Dead was slated to be the next big thing from the studio. It was another four-player cooperative multiplayer game along the same lines of Payday 2, except this time with a fresh coat of zombie paint. Problems arose when the heads of Starbreeze Studios had their heads up their ass and started to throw their money around left and right. Payday 2 at the time sold 9 million units. Between that and the constant stream of DLC that I subsequently bought every single one of, Starbreeze had quite a bit of cash in its bank, which they quickly threw at the Valkyrie engine. It was an extremely hard engine to use and in the end needed to be scrapped. Starbreeze also invested a bunch of money into a bunch of different VR studios, which all flopped considering that, you know, VR is still a new developing technology that only weird geeks like myself and other computer nerds who had way too much money to throw around. VR is still incredibly expensive and requires incredibly expensive hardware to run. So what does that mean? Well, considering the VR studios flopped and Valkyrie Engine ended up costing more than a boatload of cash, the publisher was hemorrhaging money. Uh, what does this translate to? Well, the team had roughly one year, and I did not, uh, <laughs> misquote that, roughly one year to make a AAA multiplayer shooter from scratch on the Unreal Engine which was an engine that nobody at the studio were familiar with. Despite this, the dev team threw everything that they had at the project voluntarily. Crunch and overtime hours racked up. Everyone knew that if this game did not become successful, they all could lose their jobs and their security. Eventually, when the game became playable, testers would show up and ultimately be afraid to give feedback considering just how much was wrong with the product and also how much their jobs depended on this. That said, news outlets and influencers were far less apprehensive to discuss the problems with this game. In the end, when Overkill's The Walking Dead was released, not a single person at that studio thought it was going to end well. They knew this was a bad product. They had no choice but to release it when it was released because there was no money left. It was a devastating, emotionally trying time for everyone involved. When push came to shove, the media bashed the game. People generally did not like it, and rightfully so. It was not a good game. It was a cobbled together uh, mod, essentially made in less than a year. And as a result, it sold way below expectations. 
Fearing their financial future, one person at Starbreeze sold off all of their stocks the day before the game launch and subsequently was arrested for insider trading. The CEO of Starbreeze, the, one of the creators of Payday 2, stepped down as well. Things started to get crazy. Apparently, Skybound Entertainment cut ties with Starbreeze due to the low sales and negative fan reception of the new Walking Dead game. The planned console ports were cancelled, the game was removed from Steam, and the Season 2 content was almost cancelled. But Starbreeze managed to come to an agreement with Skybound Entertainment, which allowed for the promised Season 2 content to be released, which you can still get today if you happen to have already bought Overkill's The Walking Dead, which can no longer be bought. So, eh? Basically, the Overkill's Walking Dead can no longer be bought. If you happen to own the game, still, you can play it, and even pay to upgrade to the Season 2 content, but in the end, over time, the memory of this game will fade just like Were the Roses, and fully transition into the realm of lost media. Eventually, this game will stop working on modern operating systems. People will not be able to play it anymore, especially with each other, and eventually it will just all be gone. And all because the people at the top mishandled the massive amount of money they started with. And in the end, the people who poured their hearts and souls into this game spent countless days working 42 hour shifts. Those are the people paying, the people who lost their jobs. Right now, Starbreeze is still around, working on some sort of 4v4 mobile port of Payday 2, which just looks... Well, let's be honest here, this looks fucking pathetic. And... Yeah. That's it for one of the most critically acclaimed studios around. People who generally made good products and generally had amazing people working for them. And the only thing we have to remember them for that is a game in itself that has been abandoned, not by choice, but due to failed expectations. Of all the games on this list, Club Penguin is probably the one that's the most memed. And for a lot of millennial gamers, it conjures up a lot of nostalgic feelings. Me though? Not so much since most games had a two-player local limit in my day. Club Penguin launched on October 4th, 2005, developed by New Horizon Interactive, now absorbed into Disney Canada. The game was a success almost straight out of the box, spawning a huge player base of 30 million in just two years. This, of course, caught the attention of the mouse, and in 2007, New Horizons was acquired, and Club Penguin became part of the Disney experience. The target demographic was kids aged 6 to 14, which made child safety a primary focus of the game. Players could participate in all kinds of mini-games and events, all while using a heavily moderated canned chat system. That kind of focus on safety meant parents felt okay letting their kids join the site with the cute little penguin avatars, and its player base eventually grew to well over 200 million. But nothing gold can stay, not even for little flightless cartoon birds. It started in 2015. Declining player numbers meant that Disney would no longer see the game as profitable, and layoffs at New Horizons inevitably began. When questioned about the layoffs, Disney said that it was necessary to reduce the workforce into smaller teams and increase the efficiency. And while a shutdown wasn't mentioned, well, the writing was pretty much on the wall. On January 30th, 2017, it was announced that Club Penguin would be shutting down for keeps on March 29th of that same year. Before the servers were switched off, players gathered together online one last time to celebrate the community that they had been such a big part of. Back in 2009, when Xbox was really presenting its A-game, an Xbox Live arcade game known as One vs. 100 was released. The game was based on the game show of the same name, having aired since the early 2000s to the mid-to-late 2010s internationally. The game involved a single contestant called The One, who had to go up against 100 spectators referred to as The Mob. The goal of The One was to choose the correct answer for each trivia question, often being given three choices. The Mob also had to answer questions as well, but each individual member of The Mob who failed to answer correctly would then be disqualified, reducing the total number of contestants. 
A third group within the game called The Crowd were spectators who could opt in to answer alongside the one or the mob. The Crowd, as you can easily guess, was anyone who downloaded the game and tuned in during its active period. If the one answered incorrectly, they were eliminated and the prize money got distributed amongst the remaining mob. If the one answers correctly alongside the mob, the game would continue. The one also had the choice to end the game and take their current prize, or try their luck at advancing to the next stages. Each session of the game would last up to 30 minutes, alongside live airings of the actual game show. Microsoft's video game adaption of the game show franchise saw massive popularity amongst Xbox players since it was completely free to play, having almost as many as 2.5 million downloads during its lifetime. Instead of cash, winners of this version of 1 vs. 100 could see themselves winning rewards such as Microsoft points and free Xbox Live Arcade games. Alongside this, the North American version of 1 vs. 100 saw itself earn a place within the Guinness World Records, earning the title of most contestants in a game show having amassed over 114,000 players at a time. Sadly, around July 15th, 2010, Microsoft stated they would not be continuing 1 vs. 100. A Season 3 was never released because Microsoft didn't want to invest the funds to pay people to come up with new trivia questions and furthermore to host the game, and thus it slowly faded out of existence. Those who were lucky enough to play it remember the game being extremely fun and thrilling, and we have yet to see anything quite like it pop up again. It's doubtful we'll ever get a chance to play another game like this in any form, and even if we could, the live stakes required to present the authentic experience is kinda lost. Unless you want to put up prizes from your own pockets. We're pretty sure everyone's heard about this one, but for those who haven't, we'll give you the short version. PT represented something more than just a teaser, more than just a possible revival of the beloved Silent Hill franchise. It honestly looked like a leap forward in game design itself within the horror genre. Without any promotion, it took the internet by storm, and it truly was something special. The puzzles, the narrative, they all played into one another spectacularly, and the internet as a whole work together to solve the secrets laid out before us, only to be rewarded with one of the most hype game trailers in the world. Unfortunately, Konami's mobile game division was making money hand over fist, and whereas mobile games require few resources and yield extremely high profits, Kojima's productions take roughly half a decade, millions of dollars, and have a very high risk to reward ratio. Don't get me wrong, Kojima's games are amazing, they make piles of money, and have vibrant communities who love them. But Konami didn't see it like that. Now, while we can understand letting Kojima go, and even understand why they would pursue mobile game development over AAA game development, what wasn't really sitting well with fans was removing Kojima's name from his own works. And if that wasn't enough, PT, this amazing example of what video game storytelling can be, was removed from the PlayStation storefront. And when people tried to recreate the game using the Unreal Engine for historical preservation purposes, Konami, of course, started handing out legal notices. In a nutshell, Konami has been actively preventing people from experiencing this free game. That's right, it's not like they were protecting an IP or trying to maintain their copyright's ability to make money. Konami just doesn't seem to like the fact that people want to play something Kojima made. PS4s with PT still installed on them are being sold at a marked up price, which, at the very least, makes the scalpers rather happy. Ocarina of Time is one of the most beloved and popular N64 games ever to be produced. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a big fan of Zelda, but this is a property I'm very intimate and familiar with just because of the pop culture surrounding it and the amount of content, love, and admiration put into this singular game by the fans who happen to post it on places like YouTube and Twitch and the speedrunning community. So, to those of you who happen to know all of this because they are absolutely Zelda fanatics, you can probably skip this one. However, I do think there might be some new and interesting information you guys might not have heard before. Originally, Nintendo was unaware of the capabilities of the N64. Because of this, the scope for the next Zelda title was narrow, focused, and of course, like Nintendo likes to do, refined to a fine tooth point. This was until more information about the N64 became available to the developers, and more importantly, 
More information about the planned add-on, the N64 disk drive, was set in stone. At this point in development, the team set out to experiment and truly create an open world which befitted Zelda and Ocarina of Time greatly. On top of expanding the story, setting, and gameplay, Nintendo had fully intended on releasing an expansion for Zelda Ocarina of Time titled Aura Zelda. The best way to think of this game is another Zelda game that used the world of Ocarina of Time as a base, changing the game by making dungeons more difficult, adding new enemies, and changing some story elements around and additional gameplay. That can be only speculated on at this point, as there was only a few trailers and a few showings at E3 back in the 90s. Due to the complete and utter failure of the Nintendo disk drive, this expansion, while fully completed, was never officially released. Instead, many assets and concepts were used in other games such as Majora's Mask and Skyward Sword, but this should be noted that Aura was completed and never released in one complete form. Sometime in 2010-2011, fans set out to change this. Instead of letting Aura fall deeper into the unknown with each passing day, an environmental artist by the name of Zeth64 set out to recreate the game using what little information was made available. It made heavy strides, had a complete and original soundtrack, and was praised by pretty much everyone in that sphere of retro gaming. Normally, this would be the part where we say Nintendo set lawyers after these people to remove a fun project in the name of protecting profitability. Instead though, the problem with this project falls squarely on the shoulders of Zeth. What started out as a faithful recreation of Zelda Ura turned into a reimagined version of Ura with a completely reworked story, additional levels, and a higher focus on the story elements than classical Zelda gameplay. In fact, they originally started using Ocarina of Time as a base, just like the original Ura patch. However, without warning, Zeph made everyone throw away all their work so they could swap over to the Majora's Mask engine. According to people who worked on this project, Zeph would be apprehensive to discuss what exactly he wanted done, often changing things with big sweeping titles that would be dropped with no room for discussion. A dev who goes by the name Spire had an idea for one of the final boss scenes, which Zeph objected to, basically saying that it was far too complicated for Spire to do. Spire disagreed, they fought, and Spire left the project. This led to another user by the name of Sakura to be stuck with a double workload. Zeph would then start to pester Sakura for work all the time, turning her from a volunteer and friend of seven years into a double full-time employee that got no pay. Eventually, she told Zeph that it was just too much. She felt used and wanted to leave. Zeph responded to this by basically calling her unreasonable. Zeph ended up unfriending her and destroying yet another friendship. A few hours after that, the writer, website master, and general quality assurance tester, Shadowfire, was confronted by Zeph. He wanted it all gone. Take down the website, the donation button, the community, delete videos, everything it needed to go. Shadowfire was fine with all of this, except for the deletion of what already had been done and the destruction of the community pages. Shadowfire had already invested $2,000 into the Zelda community forum and understandably just didn't want to shut it off. The worst part about all the hype that Zeph managed to get for this game, the amount of people excited to the point where they had to have their own community forum for this game specifically, is that this might have been vaporware to begin with. We cannot confirm if Zeph really did anything outside of repurpose assets given to him and create concept art. All the saves given to Shadowfire were limited in scope and mostly glitched up files for Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. Zeph accepted a unknown amount of donations for this project, which was even more insulting considering that every time a convention would offer to showcase his stuff and pay for him to even come down and say hi, 
something bad would happen right before it. For example, one time, right before he was required to show up, Zeph would claim that he was hit by a car, on top of having his graphics card card crash on him, destroying all the work he had apparently done, on top of, you know, having to be in a hospital that also somehow didn't have power, meaning that even Skyping to the convention was impossible. Wow, this sounds incredibly believable. Other excuses were made too, such as the death of family, friends, and other anxiety-related issues. In the end, Zeph disappeared and tried to take everything down with him. Rather it was the small amount of work other people had completed in the name of his projects, the assets he created himself, and the community in what seems to be an attempt to cover up or downplay the amount of money he had received. All of it seemingly disappearing overnight. If he had his hand in it, he would try to get rid of it. And then he just disappeared. Now, despite all of this shenanigans I'm telling you about over a stupid mod that was supposedly supposed to release uh, sometime a couple of years ago, I personally think that the worst part about all of this is the friends that were left in the wake of this. Zeph acquired a team of mod developers that were mostly his friends he used to talk to in a forum. People he had been playing games and having fun with for over six to eight years. Those memories completely ruined and tarnished as he left them with the drama that soon ensued after a lot of people had their hopes for this project dashed. People who had spent a decent amount of money donating to him in the hopes that something would get done. All just gone as he cut and left. And between the anxiety, the drama, and everything involved, all I have to say is this. No matter the project you're working on, no matter the job you have, nothing is worth your mental sanity and your emotional health. That's a bit of a reoccurring theme on this list. Uh, people throwing themselves into a project only for it to either be ripped away from them or somehow end up failing, leaving them jobless, which is absolutely horrible. If something's not going to work, Maybe it's best to abandon it before you lose a bit too much of yourself in its wake. Hey, it looks like you made it to the end of yet another video. I do have something I actually want to quickly say. While making this video, I got terrible anxiety attacks and I was unable to even look at the script without feeling sick to my stomach. I I'm not necessarily sure why, it just, I felt really bad while trying to make this into something. But something changed while I was working on this. I made a post on YouTube asking for uh, writers and editors to give me a help out just because it was taking me too long to put this out and a lot of amazing people came forward and to those amazing people I'd, I'd like to thank you personally right now in the video. Uh, Andy Demon, Erica, Aluwu, and 808 Clutch. You guys really saved my butt on this, and I want everyone to know that you saved this list and made it possible. I'd also like to thank the editors that came forward to Gerbo and Dalsik, Uplifted Kid, as well as Pufferfish, who really went above and beyond to really help me out. These people, again, came forward and helped me get this thing done in a reasonable amount of time, so yeah, I'd really like to thank you. With that said, the people you see on screen now are amazing Patreon people who make it so that I can pay writers, editors, and all that fun stuff to keep making amazing videos like this. I'd like to personally thank Tar Workman, Matthew, Alani, Luna, and Seuss Party for, again, for being my top donators. Close to that, we got Giblet and Cedric Crisp for Again, thank you for donating. These videos take a lot of effort from a lot of different people. Hell, even Blame It On Jorge helped me out quite a bit by making the animated intro for this. So to everyone who worked on this video, thank you. Thank you to the Patreon people, not just the ones I named out personally, but also everyone you see on screen now. My next video should be a editorial on Made in Abyss, so stay tuned for that. I'm hoping to have that out before Halloween. With that said, I hope to see you guys next time. Don't forget, the sun is always going to rise in the morning whether you're there or not. So, 
you might as well be there and enjoy it with the rest of us. Have a good one, and have a beautiful life. <laughs>